Hey guys, how's everybody doing today? Um, I, we're gonna get going in about five minutes. I just wanna do a quick sound check. Can you guys uh, throw a hand up if you can hear me okay? <laughs> Hey, awesome. It sounds like, for the most part, uh, everybody can hear me. Um, again, we got a couple of more people that I'm just waiting to, to join, and we'll, we'll get going in about uh, three or so more minutes. Hey guys, we're gonna get going in about one more minute. Can I just have everybody throw their hands up again? Uh, just to let you know that you can, just to let me know that you can hear me okay. Awesome, thank you. Everybody should also be able to see my screen as well. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is John Anastasides, and this is our Locked in Learning series. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at Visilogic, Ladder, HMI, and Memory. So we're gonna take a look at some things that you can use in order to put together an application for whatever system you have. Okay, so um, I haven't heard any update uh, on any sort of continuation of NHL playoffs. So for the time being, we're going to continue with this series. Uh, we're on to the fun stuff now. This week, we're taking a look at ladder, HMI, and memory. On Tuesday's webinar, Zach showed you ladder, HMI, and memory for the Unistream series controller. Great job, Zach. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the Visilogic series. Next week, we have data logging. Unistream will be held on Tuesday. Visilogic will be held on Thursday. And in week four, communications. Tuesday will be Unistream, and Thursday will be for the Vision series. So I don't have as long of a presentation for you guys today. Today is going to be mostly uh, handled in the software. I do want to show you one quick slide just to kind of tie everything together. So when you build an application in the software, you're going to have a ladder portion, an HMI portion, 
in memory is going to tie those two together. Now, when I say a latter portion of the project, you can think of this as your control center. Uh, this is going to allow you to create any sort of sequencing, timing, starting, stopping, uh, anything that goes into the system on a logical level is going to be completed or generated in the latter portion of the project. You're going to have a number of nets and in those nets you can house rungs of code that will execute a certain portion of the project for you. Now what you build, uh, when you build your, your logic, you are going to create routines. You're always going to have at least one routine in a project. Uh, the main routine is going to be what is running all the time. You do have the ability to create subroutines as well. Now, when you create subroutines, these can be used uh, from anything from organizational purposes to having a particular set of code run when on a particular display or upon jumping to a display. Uh, depending on what is needed for the application, you have the ability to create a structure of routines that work best for you. Uh, in this ladder code, you're going to have a number of context coils, which we're going to go in depth on today. Uh, you're also going to have function blocks based on what you are trying to, to, to achieve in the project. If you have PID at play, if you have communications at play, uh, those are going to be based on function blocks and where they are called or activated in the logic. Now, the HMI portion of the project, this is the human machine interface also known as a GUI, graphical interface, right? Uh, this is how the user is going to interact with the face of the controller. Now, if you have start, stop buttons, uh, if you want to set up a schedule on the HMI display, um, you're going to have a number of HMI tools in order to accomplish this. Now, Vision Series controllers have touchscreen models they also have models where you only have hard keys and then you have a mix of both. Uh, touch is going to allow you to create soft buttons on screen in a layout that you choose, whereas hard keys are going to be programmable physical keys on the face of the controller. So I'll give you the 1040, for example, if you remember from last week, right? That's gonna have a touch screen and also a number of programmable hard keys at the bottom. So you can use uh, a combination of soft buttons on screen and also let's just say if you have uh, the controller in like a food processing plant, if you walk up to the unit with gloves on, um, you have hard keys to start and stop processes as well. Also located on the HMI portion of the project is a diagnostic menu called info mode. This is the internal menu to the controller that's built in. You don't have to do any sort of programming in order to access this. Uh, what you do have to do is hold the finger on the touch screen, enter the password. Default is going to be 111141s, but you do have the ability to change it. This is going to allow you to manipulate and also adjust, uh, manipulate operands and adjust settings in runtime while the PLC is on. So it's a very neat troubleshooting tool uh, and it is available for you by default. You don't have to enable it or, or program it or anything. Now, memory is what is going to tie the ladder and the HMI together. You'll see that you'll be able to cross-reference uh, in our examples the memory that is in the ladder portion of the project and in the HMI portion of the project. In the Vision series, unlike the Unistream series, which has a dynamically allocated memory map, we have a static memory map. So based on the controller model that you choose, you have a predetermined number of bits, numerics, timers, uh, all those different operands, they're set aside in, by a certain number for you depending on the memory of the controller that you have selected. Uh, and based on what is in use, you have a column in your operands window that will tell you what is currently in use and what you still have available. Now, when I say operands, these are your different types of elements that you can use throughout the project. So you have bits, uh, numbers, timers, physical inputs, physical outputs. You also have a number of system-related memory. All of these are operands that you can reference or use in the troubleshooting and programming process. 
All right, so I'm not gonna put you to sleep with a slideshow this week. Uh, we're gonna jump right into the software. Now, what I have here is a brand new project. Today, I am using a V570, which is a 5.7-inch uh, touchscreen. This is gonna allow me to create an HMI portion of the project and a ladder portion of the project using the memory that I have available. Now, when I hit OK, I now have the ability to move throughout the application. What I wanted to show you guys first today is the operands tab that is part of the output window at the bottom of the software. So you'll see at the bottom here, we have a number of tabs, operands, watches, memory, find, compile, event log, and project optimizer. In the operands tab, make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. This is going to be your predetermined memory map for the project in the controller model that you've selected. So you'll see that you have inputs, outputs, timers, and so on. I'm gonna start with inputs and outputs. Inputs and outputs are gonna be physical operands, right? Based on the memory configuration, I'm sorry, based on the hardware configuration that you choose. You'll see that right now, none of these are in use, right? You don't have the ability to determine what is in use. What you have to do is you have to go to your hardware configuration, and based on whatever for the 570 snap-in module you're using, let's just say if I was to use an E1, based on the configuration that I choose, this is going to determine the number of physical inputs and physical outputs that I have in use for the project. And you'll see that I can also add a description for what that physical point is doing. So you don't click on in use, uh, for the physical inputs and outputs, these are determined based on uh, the actual configuration that you're going to have for the project. Now, timers, right, you'll see that for the V570, you have a large number of timers, 384. What these can be used throughout the project as is if you want to add a delay, uh, for any sort of process, or if you want to determine that uh, we're going to run a machine for a certain amount of time, timers can be used. We have three different types, and these are going to allow you to uh, enable some sort of time-based control, right? And we're going to do uh, an example today where we have a delay button that turns on a light, and I'll show you exactly how those are going to be referenced from a ladder standpoint. Next, we have memory bits, right? You'll see in this list you have uh, memory bits or M, you have X or fast, and then you have S or system. Now the difference between these three types, memory is going to be retained on power cycle. So if you have a bit that is on in the project and it, let's just say it's, it's MB1, right? Uh, on power cycle, that state is gonna be retained by the controller unless you assign a power up value for it, right? So you can use memory bits in order to save where you left off, if you will, upon power cycle or power failure. X operands, also known as fast operands, are not going to retain state on power up, right? So if you have, let's just say a memory bit and you have a power up value of reset, if you are nearing the ceiling of memory for your project, you can replace those with X operands because that is essentially going to wipe out any sort of state or number uh, that was in that particular operand previously on power up. So those are the difference between memory operands and X operands. System operands are going to be built in operands that are always available to you either in the background for monitoring or if you wanted to reference them for conditions in the project, you absolutely have the ability to do so, but these are not going to be created. These are already there for you. When we get down there, I'll show you some, some ones of, of, I'll point out some ones of, of interest slash ones that are used most frequently. So memory bits, right? You think of a bit, it is based on state. So you either have a bit that is off or on. So it is 
binary. You can use these for binary image variables, binary text variables, and so on, based on whatever conditions are in the beginning of the ladder net, you have the ability to either turn a bit on or off. Memory integers, right, these are going to be a number, a numeric element. Uh, the, a memory integer specifically is a 16-bit signed integer ranging from negative 32,768 to positive 32,767. 32, now, you don't have to remember this at all. You can find the information in the help file. Um, but I just want to point out the differences between your uh, numeric operands that you have. You have uh, a memory integer, you have a memory long integer, also known as memory long or ML. That is going to be a 32-bit signed integer, right? So that is going to range from uh, negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. You also have double words, which is a 32-bit unsigned integer. That is only going to be positive. It's going to range from 0 to 4 billion. So depending on what you are trying to do in the application, if it is vital uh, that you don't roll over into the negative, let's just say if you're trying to keep track of um, you know, runtime cycles or, or acknowledgments from like a field device, um, it would not make sense in any case for that to be negative, right? So you would use a double word. Now just keep in mind, because those are larger operand types, you have less of them available. So in a large project, you want to make sure that um, you are trying to be as efficient as possible when determining which operand is going to be used where. Um, again, so you have fast operands or X operands. You can think of as the same exact uh, descriptions from above, but these are not going to be retained on power up. So memory, again, will be retained on power up, and fast operands will not be retained on power up. Now, you also have memory floats available. These are going to be floating point registers that allow you to work with real numbers. So let's just say in a case where you needed to show an exact engineering value. Um, you would use a memory float instead of integers, longs, and double words because those are only going to be integers. You do not have the ability to hold a fractional portion of a number within one of those operands. You would have to use a memory float. Uh, a real life example, if you were trying to do some sort of formula in the project, um, what you can do is you can get an exact result stored into a memory float that will give you the real uh, number that is within that that register, the real true result of what that formula is providing. Now system bits, again these are binary, right, so these are on or off, but what they're doing on a system level is uh, whatever they're specified as in this list. So you have a number of bits that you can use throughout the project, you can use for monitoring, you can always go into info mode and, and reference the state of these. I just want to point out a couple ones that are uh, popular, if you will. SB2, system bit 2, this is the power up bit. This bit is going to go high one time and one time only on the very first scan of the controller. So if you have any sort of configuration that is happening, Typically, you're going to have one of the conditions be SB2, so it catches on the very first scan of the controller, so you do not have to worry about it again in runtime of the actual project. You also have one second pulse and 100 millisecond pulse that can replace a timer for you. So if you have an application where uh, you have a lot of time-based control, uh, let's just say you don't want to waste a one-second timer. You can actually use and reuse this SB3 bit. So you have a built-in one second pulse and a built-in 100 millisecond pulse that you can use throughout the project. Uh, one last one that I'm going to touch on today is SB8. That can tell you if your battery is low. If you see a one, right, let's just say you run into an issue where uh, you might think that there is a memory issue with the controller, you have memory operands in use, but it is not retaining state on power up. You always want to double check SB8, make sure that that battery is not low. Uh, that can be di directly related to, to memory loss. System integers, right, you'll see SI0 is the scan time of the controller. Uh, you also have a number of utilities that you can check like SI9, which is the backlight intensity. You also can write to system integers, right? So let's just say if I wanted to have uh, a sleep screen, if I have an application that might be outdoors um, in order to preserve the backlight, 
let's just say if a user has not come into contact with the HMI display in roughly 30 or 45 minutes or so, you can actually store a zero to SI9 and it will dim the backlight to its lowest intensity. Once the user comes back, uh, you can use SB16, system bit 16. In this list is the touchscreen active bit. Uh, once that gets triggered, you can store a 100 back into the backlight intensity or any value within the range of zero to 100 for these guys, and the backlight will adjust uh, accordingly. And again, system longs, same kind of deal here. System double words, these are going to be more so for counts or sessions, right? Because these are going to be, let's just say, in a, in a situation where you have communications happening. You might have a number of sessions that um, you're trying to do all the time. That number can get greater than 32,767 real fast. So you want to make sure that you have a larger size operand in order to hold those. Now, one more thing I'm going to mention while we're talking about memory, you do have the ability to use constants in a project as well. If you want to hard code a value uh, in the application where it is looking for some sort of numeric register, you do have the ability to use a pound 100 for a hard coded value of 100, pound 50, and so on. And we're actually going to see an example of that today as well. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to jump into the main routine and I'm going to show you what the ladder editor looks like. You'll see a number of nets here that are numbered sequentially and within these nets we can house rungs of code. Now all of your different elements or tools are going to be listed up here in this top toolbar. If you click Boolean, you're gonna have your number of contacts and coils available. So for contacts, we have a direct contact, inverted contact, positive transition, negative transition. Uh, based on what is needed, right? If you needed to continuously pass power while on, continuously pass power while off, or trigger some sort of, some sort of one-shot condition, uh, you can use these contacts accordingly. These you can think of as your inputs to your statement, right? Your if statements. Coils, you're gonna have a number of uh, coils here. So you have direct coil inverted, set, reset, and toggle. Depending on what needs to happen in the application, if you need to hold a state, if you wanna reset something that is off, if you wanna turn on or off based on the previous state, you can use these number of coils. Uh, these are going to be the outputs to your statements, right? So you'll see that when we do our first example of a button and light, uh, us pressing the button tied to a contact is going to be our input. The light being on or off based on the coil being energized or not is going to be the output to the statement. Now we have comparisons, right? Greater than, greater or equal, equal not equal, less than or equal, or less than or within range. These are great uh, in applications where let's just say if you are monitoring tank level or temperature, these are gonna allow you to use numeric values in the ladder in order to show an alarm on screen, um, prompt the user to turn down the set point, something along those lines. We'll do an example a little bit later in this lesson, uh, and I'll show you exactly how to use uh, numerics in that form. Now, we also have tools for math, right? If you need to add, subtract, or create your own formula or linearize an analog input, this is where you want to be located, right here, the math drop-down menu. Logic. Uh, logic can be used for uh, bit level events. You also have the ability to shift and rotate. Store is going to allow you to uh, reset a numeric uh, element. You also have the ability to store one number into a different operand, right? So if you wanted to take the value in memory integer one and store it to memory integer 100 for later use, your direct store would allow you to do that. You also have the ability to store timer presets in uh, timer current values as well. Your vector tools, if you are working with vectors, 
or a group of operands, right? You have the ability to use these tools in order to compare, copy, fill an entire array or vector. Uh, these are where all of your tools when you're working in groups are gonna be located. If you're working with strings, uh, these are where all your string tools are located. If you wanted to find a particular character in a string, let's just say if you had a barcode reader coming in and you only cared about the information after the pound sign, for example, you have the ability to separate that as well. Uh, I think it might have been an issue with with my mic. I'm I'm sorry about that. Can you guys can you guys hear me? Okay. Just throw a hand up if you can hear me. Awesome. All right, cool. I just wanted to make sure that you guys can hear me. Okay. Um, in the utilities menu, these are where all of your calls are going to be located. If you're calling a subroutine, calling an HMI. And also if you have uh, any sort of uh, alarms or clock functions at play in the project, you have the ability to use the, the tools in this menu. Data tables, these are where you have the ability to um, write to a table, read out from a table. If you have a predetermined recipe, you have the ability to pull information out. You can change the information in the table. You also can clear a full table. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more with um, data logging next week. So we're going to introduce a lot of these function blocks in the upcoming weeks. And also we'll take a look at the SD card functions that you have. Um, you have the ability to write trends to a table. You have the ability to create Excel files and so on. In the COM drop-down menu, this is where you can initialize a COM port for a number of different uh, communication protocols, whether it be serial, Ethernet, or CAN bus. And then your function blocks list. Uh, these are going to give you the ability to implement uh, items like PID, PWM, uh, GPRS communication, Modbus, uh, text message, and also if you wanted to use open protocol, you have all of your function blocks here. Uh, a lot of the function block based control we're going to take a look at in the next two weeks for the most part. Um, we're just going to really focus on contacts, coils, and numeric elements today. Now, in order to build a ladder net, we need a input and an output to a statement. So let's go ahead to Boolean. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a direct contact. What pops up here is the select operand and address. In the operand, in the operand and address bar, you have the ability to select which operand you would like to use for the particular condition, right? So if I have a button on screen that I wanna press to turn a light on, this is an example where I would use a contact. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna drop every type of contact that we have available to us and I'm gonna, I'm gonna link an incrementer afterwards to show you what happens when the bit that is tied to it is either on or off. Now I have my full memory map available to me. If I click this drop down menu, I can scroll through and get any one of these 8,192 bits. If I don't care which one I use, if I don't care which one I use and only wanna get my next unused bit, I can go ahead and click get next unused and it will give me the next one that is not in use. MB0 pops up because it is the first memory bit of the project. So if I hit okay, this is gonna allow me to tie memory bit zero to this direct contact. What a direct contact is gonna do is wait for MB0 to pass power, right? So it is normally open. When closed, it will pass power to my incrementer and the value tied to my incrementer will increase so long as memory bit zero is on. I'm gonna to go to math, I'm gonna take an increment tool, and I'll put this right in series with MB zero. 
Now, if I get my next unused MI, this is going to allow me to generate a number that is going to be stored into this operand, right? So when MB0 is on, MI0 is going to continuously increment. And I'm going to build this logic, and when we download the application to the controller, I'm going to, I'm going to go more in depth in online mode at exactly what these guys are doing. If we wanted a contact to pass power when it is off, a normally closed, we can get an inverted contact, get our next unused memory bit, MB1, and I'm going to put a second incrementer with a second MI in series. Now, when MB1 is off, it is going to pass power to our incrementer. Uh, you'll see that the reason why I'm tying these conditions or these statements to the left side uh, of the software, this is going to be our power rail. This power rail is going to constantly provide power to any net that we want to build in our project. So if you have something connected to the power rail, power once it once that routine is being scanned is always going to be flowing. Based on the conditions, uh, you may or may not reach the end of the net, right? So let's just say, for example, in net one, MB0 is off. My incrementer is never seeing any power. Once MB0 is on or closes, then we will see MI0 start to increment. Now, I know that there are a number of software packages where you actually have to connect your rung to the rail on the right. You do not have to do that for Visilogic or for Unilogic. Now, in conditions where we need a one-shot pulse, where we just need something to happen one single time, if I go to my positive transition contact, I can get my next unused MB2. And if I place an incrementer in series with my positive transition contact of MB2, Every time only on the rising edge of MB2 turning on is my number going to increment. And you'll see that I've used different bits and different MIs uh, in each of these nets. That is so I don't overwrite the value based on another condition, right? I want to make sure that um, the, the operands that I'm using are independent to the particular net that I'm creating. So again, positive transition on the rising edge of the bit that is tied to this contact is when power will be passed. We have one more contact, a negative transition, which is going to pass power when the bit is falling. So when the bit is going low, this is when this particular bit will pass power. And I'll put one more incrementer in series. And again, when I download this application, I'm going to run through each of these and I'll show you exactly what they're doing. So that's just a quick introduction to bits. Now what I want to do is I want to tie the ladder and the HMI together. Now you do not have uh, any sort of restrictions on what to program first. If you want to program all of your ladder logic and then create your, my, create your HMI afterwards, you absolutely have the ability to do that. If you wanted to create your HMI first and get the layout down and then go back and create the ladder, you have the ability to do so and also vice versa. It does not matter at any point um, what you are creating first you just want to make sure that the memory being used lines up with what needs to happen it's very important not to reuse memory in cases where it might not or should not be used so the first example that we're going to do is we are going to build a button on screen that when i press and hold a light will turn on for as long as i am holding what i'm going to do in my vertical 
ladder toolbar, right? These are going to be the most common items used in the ladder. You'll see we have a number of contacts, a number of coils, a reset numeric, an incrementer that we just used, and then a number of calls. What I can do is I can grab a direct contact. I'm going to get my next unused. You'll see memory bit four is the one that comes up. I'm going to give this a description this time so I know exactly what it is and exactly what it's doing in the project. This is going to be my light switch. So when I create a button on screen, I'm going to tie MB4 as the touch property so that once this is active in the ladder or once I press the button in the ladder, it will close and start to pass power to the coil that is tied to our light. So I'll hit OK here. The next thing I'm going to do is grab a direct contact and I'm going to get my next unused bit because this has to be its own independent operand and this is going to be my light. So I'll hit OK. Now you have the ability to expand nets, right? You have a draw tool that I can you can double click within the net to extend out. You also have the ability to extend nets with the draw tool. All I care about is this portion here, right? So power will pass through all the way, but since this net has, or since this rung has nothing else in it, right? The only thing that's gonna really change is, is MB5. Now you can double click on a net to size it appropriately. I have a rather small laptop screen, so I might wanna have as much space as possible. If I have extended my net down, double clicking will basically resize it accordingly for me. Now, if I go to the startup display, I have a vertical toolbar that is acting as my HMI icon toolbar, right? So I have the ability to create shapes like buttons. I can add text to the screen. I can have images on screen. I can build text images, numeric elements, graphs. If I click on the more buttons down here, you'll see that I can have timer boxes and so on, right? So depending on what needs to be on the HMI for the application, you have a number of different tools. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna grab a button I'm going to drag and drop this button to size it. And I'm going to call this light switch. Now, if I want to in, in, incorporate some sort of text wrapping to maybe uh, keep the button at a particular size while showing all the text on screen, I can hit enter. And this will drop me down to my next line and I can have the full word light switch on a rather small button. Now, the first thing I'm going to do here before I discuss some of the properties, I'm going to add a touch bit, right? So whenever I touch this button, the bit that is tied here is going to go high, right? We created MB4 as our light switch. So what I want to do is I want to get MB4 here, and I'm going to hit OK. Now, you'll see I have a number of properties, right? I can change everything from the alignment of the text on the button I can change the font. I can also change the color of the button and the text when pressed and unpressed, right? So let's just say if, if these are my colors when the button is just sitting idle, when I press it, I can have it turn to yellow and black, for example, right? So based on uh, the current state of the button, if it's unpressed or pressed, the colors will be different. Now, style. Since it's a button, I want it to look like a button. I could also have it be flat. And you'll see that when you go to when you go to change the colors for an unpressed or 3D button, the choices are very minimal. When you have a flat button, you have the ability to choose a number of uh, different colors, way more uh, selection than you do with the unpressed. Now, mind you, these are just built-in buttons. Um, you can have images assigned touch properties, right? So if you wanted to make your own custom buttons, you have the ability to insert uh, your own custom images as long as they are in WMF, EMF, BMP, or JPEG format. All right, so now that I have my button created, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna create my light on screen. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to image. If I hover over image, right, I have binary image. If I drag and drop this on screen, I have the ability to choose the images for the off state and the on state. The first thing that I have to do is I have to create a link for this button, right? Now, I'm sorry, but for this for this light, we already created the button. I've already created a bit, MB5, that's going to be tied to the light. So I'm going to hit OK. And now what I have the ability to do is choose my off state image, the little zero here, and my on state image, the little one here. If I choose browse, this is going to take me to the image library. You're always going to have a, bu a button in the bottom left hand corner. If it does not bring you right to previously used images, just go to go to Visologic image library. You want to expand images C, expand image, uh, I'm sorry, expand EMF, and I'm going to go down to LEDs. And I'm just going to grab a white light to determine that the light is off currently. If I click browse again, I have the ability to choose what determines the light as on. I'm going to choose a yellow light. If I want to preview these, I can just click back and forth. And if I click OK, I can resize it to be the exact size that I'd like. So, when I, according to the logic that I've written, when I press and hold this button, this light will be on, and it will stay on until I break the press to the screen, which will turn MB4 low, which will then turn MB5 low. So that's what that net is saying. Now let's say in a case where we might wanna just press an on button, keep the light on, and then press an off button to turn the light off. If we wanted to do that, we can use our positive transition contacts and negative transition contacts. So if I grab a P contact here, I'll get my next unused. And let's say I want to have an on button and an off button on screen. I'm going to create two conditions. I'm going to have one when I press my on button. And I'm going to have a second when I press my off button. Now let's just say if I want to press and hold my button and then release to turn the light off, I can use a negative transition contact. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a negative transition contact, I'm gonna get my next unused memory bit, memory bit seven, and this is gonna be my off button. Now these are both gonna control the same light. So all I have to do is take one memory bit assigned to the light, but I need two different coils i need a set coil to turn it on and keep it on once you set a bit you need to have a reset somewhere so i'm going to need a set and a reset coil so i'm going to take the set coil i'm going to place this in series with the positive transition of mb6 i'm going to get my next unused this is going to be my on off light so you'll see that i can give these um titles here so i know exactly what they're doing in the project now i'm going to take a reset right for my off button because once that bit is high what i want the off button to do is reset the bit or turn it low again i'm going to place that right in series with my off button and you'll see that i've already created the bit for my on off light that is part of my list so i'm going to go ahead and click this and i'm going to click okay now on screen what i have the ability to do is create two buttons one is going to be for my on button I already have a touch property created, or I'm sorry, I, I already have a bit created for the button. I just need to assign it to the touch property, MB6. And what I can do is I can actually copy and paste this button in order to have it be the same size as my on button. If I want my off, my off button to look exactly like my on button, what I can do is I can copy and paste. Now, if I do a straight through copy and paste, What's gonna happen is I'm gonna get a, you cannot paste the selected element into this location. That is because we do not have the ability to layer elements in Visilogic. So what I have to do is I have to move it out of the way and then paste it. Now you have to keep in mind that when you are copy and pasting, all of the properties are going to come with the paste. 
So if I go ahead and drop this underneath my first on or my second on button, I'm going to make this bottom button my off button. I'm going to double click and you'll see that all the properties of my on button are here. I have to make sure that I change the text on the button and also the touch property. Very important because I don't want them both to do the same thing. So if I go here to the drop down, this is my memory bit list. I already have MB7 determined as my off button. I'm gonna assign this as the touch property for my off button and press okay. And the same deal with the light, I can copy and paste. Touch properties and also the image or the link and also the image properties come with it. I'm gonna reuse the same images. I'm just gonna change this to my on off light bit, which is MB8. And I can hit okay. Now I have two different instances of light controlled by two different sets of buttons. Now let's just say you run out of real estate on your HMI display. You can very easily create a second display. If you right click up, or if you right click on the startup module and choose add new display, you'll see that display one gets created. Now this naming convention is a little bit tricky at first, right? The first display that is created in a new project is the startup display. You'll see that it is highlighted in this peachy tan color. That means that on power up or on reset, that is always going to be the display that loads first. So if you wanna have like a splash screen or a logo screen or something like that, use that as the startup display. And then based on a certain time or touch or anything like that, jump to the next display in the project. So I'm gonna change this from display one. I'm just gonna call this screen two. You also have the ability to change the startup display name. You can rename it to screen one, but you'll see that it is still highlighted, right? So you don't have the ability to just make screen two the, the startup display. You wanna make sure that you have your screens laid out at the beginning because the highlighted screen is always gonna be the startup display. So I'm gonna go back to screen one. What I need in order to get to screen two is a button. So what I can do here is I can take another button. I'm gonna drop it down here in the bottom right-hand corner. I'm just gonna give it some text here just to denote that we're jumping over to the next screen. I need a touch property for the button. Now, I don't have any logic set up for this yet, right? So I'm gonna create a button and I'm gonna get my next unused bit for the touch property. This is gonna be my next button. In my logic, I can go to my next free net I can take a positive transition of MB9, and if I go to utilities in HMI, I can get a load HMI display element, and this is gonna allow me to jump to a different screen than what I'm on currently. So I can choose screen two. This is what's gonna allow me to navigate, navigate between screens. Just think about it. If you have multiple screens, you need a means to get back and forth, right? So if I hit okay, I now have the ability to get to screen two. The issue is, if I get to screen two, right, it's blank right now, I don't have the ability to get back. So I'm gonna take another button, and I'm gonna have it just denote that I am going backwards. I'm gonna make another touch property, MB10, this will be my back button. And Along with the ability to use screen calls from the ladder, right, I also have a links and jumps tab for each HMI display. You'll see that on links and jumps tab, you can have a number of subroutines, one for onload while displaying and on unload. So when you're jumping to, jumping from, and while on, you can have particular ladder logic run. Uh, you also see two columns. You have a jump condition and a display, right? I'm gonna take my back button MB10, so when I'm on this screen, if a positive tr positive transition of MB10 occurs, I know that I wanna jump back to screen one. 
So you have two means of creating screen jumps. You can use the ladder, you also can use the links and jumps tab. So whatever is easier, easier for you as the programmer. Me personally, I think that the logic itself is already cluttered once you get into a, a, a big project, right? So I'm a big fan of the links and jumps tab. This is gonna allow us to get back. Now, in a case where I, so I let's just say I have uh, an on button to turn a light on and an off button to turn a light off. If I wanted to basically just toggle the light based on its previous state, I have a coil to do that, right? So I'm gonna take a positive transition. I'm gonna get my next unused bit, memory bit 11, and this is gonna be my toggle light switch. If I go up to Boolean and go to Coils and come down to Toggle, I have the ability to tie a bit here, MB12, and based on the previous state, right, whenever I trigger MB11, MB12 is going to turn to what it was not before. So it was on, it's going to turn off. If it was off, it's going to turn on. This Toggle Coil basically um replaces a net that is a parallel statement to say exactly what i just uh said verbally right so the toggle coil just saves you a little bit of time when you're programming and this is going to be my toggle light and if i go to screen two i'm going to take a button this is going to be my toggle switch And I already have the ladder created, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my memory map drop-down menu. I'm going to grab MB11 as my switch. And I'm going to take a binary image as my light, right? I already have the ladder created again. MB12 is my toggle light. Now I just have to choose an off-state image and an on-state image. I'm going to grab a white light and a green light, and press OK. Now whenever I press this switch, if it was white before, it's gonna turn green, and if it was green before, it's gonna turn white. So that basically allows you to have a set and a reset, if you will, with one button. So those are your contacts and coils. Again, uh, once I download this and go online, we're gonna take a quick run through and I'll show you exactly what everything is doing. Uh, and again, I, I, I think that I mentioned this at the beginning. If I didn't, make sure that you guys are um, typing out your questions in real time and I'll, I'll get to them uh, at the end of the demonstration. Let's say if I had a case where I wanted to have a user hold a button for a certain amount of time before that button or before that light turns on, I can create a delay in between the user pressing the button and the light coming on. And the way to do that is if I take a direct contact and I get my next unused memory bit for a button, this is gonna be my delay switch. What I can do is I can use this button to control a timer or constantly power a timer so that it runs down a certain amount of time. And once the timer runs out, it's gonna then feed power to my light. So that is how you add a delay into a rung of logic. So I'm gonna grab timer. I'm gonna get my next unused. This is gonna be my delay time. I have the ability to give it a power up preset value. I'm gonna give it five seconds. Now you wanna ideally separate all of your rungs of code into different nets. That's gonna guarantee scan time. The way the controller is gonna scan is top to bottom and left to right. Uh, once you are in a net, it is very, if you have two different rungs of code in the same net, um, the scan happens too fast for us to determine what the naked eye, what is happening first. The only way that we can guarantee correct scanning is if you have everything sequentially in their own net. So I'm gonna take in a different net. Once the timer is being powered, T0, right? When it is done, 
you can think of it as an output bit, right? We want to power this light on. So all we're essentially doing here is we are adding a time delay in between the button and the light. So the button controls the timer, the timer running out then controls the light. So once I release power from uh, the button, the timer is no longer powered, which means the light will no longer be powered. So this is gonna be my delay light. And if I come to screen two, what I'm gonna do is I am going to cop, I'm gonna copy and paste. Now remember when you do a copy and paste, all the properties come with it. So this is gonna be my delay switch. And I need to make sure that I am tying my delay switch bit, MB13. For my light, I'm gonna keep the same colors, but it's not a toggle light anymore. It is a delay light, and that was MB14. And I can hit okay. Now, when you have time-based applications, right, a lot of times you're gonna have the user have either control of what the preset is or some sort of representation of the current time, so where you're at currently in the process. I want you to be able to see how much more time we have to hold this switch for before the light comes on. So if I go into my more buttons, I'm gonna have a little black square wave here that if I drag and drop on screen, I can set this as my timer current value. I'll make uh, the font a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna choose current. You'll see that I could choose current or preset if I want to give the user the ability to change it on screen. I can choose keypad entry. I only care about seeing the current time. Now display, right? You have remaining time and elapsed time. Remaining time is gonna be counting down from the preset. Elapsed time is gonna be counting up to the preset. Now if you have a process where you are controlling like a total runtime, you wanna make sure that the preset time accounts for that. If you have a preset time of five seconds and you wanna display elapsed, that timer is going to stop counting at five, right? So if you wanna make sure that you can get up to two hours, you wanna make sure that the preset time is two hours or above. Now all I have to do is link my timer here and I can hit okay. And this is gonna show my current time. Now again, I'm, I'm building this project. I'm gonna download and I'm gonna show you online mode in a second here. One last thing I wanna introduce before we download is numeric tools, right? So I have a number box here on screen. And you'll see that I have a lot of properties for my numeric variables. The first thing that I need is a link. I'm gonna get my next unused MI, MI4, and we're just gonna call this temperature entry on screen. If I wanted to give this a power up value, so a power on value, or whenever it resets, it's going to initialize to a particular value, I can click this checkbox. If I don't, it's just gonna retain its previous value. So I'm gonna give it a power up value of zero. I'm gonna give it keypad entry, so we have the ability to enter a value of our choosing. And I'm also, you'll see that once an MI is linked, we have the minimum and maximum, which is the actual true range of the operand. I'm gonna make this a hard-coded value of zero and a hard-coded value of 100, so I cannot enter a value outside of that range. Let's just say if I wanted to show degrees Fahrenheit or degrees C afterwards, I have the ability to use text after. And if I wanted to change the style, I can change this to flat, and you'll see that my back color, I can change this to a color of my choosing. I also can make it flush with the background by choosing the current color selected, or the, the icon here in between current color selected and okay. And that's gonna just automatically line it up with exactly what the background color is, and I'll hit okay. Now let's just say if I wanted to display a particular alarm based on what that temperature is at, right? What I can do is I can go to my logic and if I go to my compare dropdown menu, 
I can get a function block that says if that value that I'm entering on screen is above a certain value, I can show a warning on the HMI display so that the user knows that it's not a safe value to have entered, right? So what I can do is I can place this right on the rail. So every single scan, I'm monitoring what that value is. That value is MI4. Let's say if I don't want it to get above a hard-coded value of 80, instead of tying another MI here, I can choose the constant tab, right? And write a pound 80 so that if that value in MI4 gets above 80 degrees, I can flash a warning on screen. And the way to do that is with a direct coil. I can get my next unused bit, MB15. This can be my high temp alarm. And hit OK. So you'll see that once this value gets above 80, this coil will be energized. Once it drops below, it will not be energized. So I want a binary text statement here that based on whatever that temperature value is, either tell me that the temperature is okay or that it's too high. So under text, if I go to binary text switch, drop this on screen here, I have text off and text on, let's just say temp okay, I'll make this green, and, and text for when it's on, that means that it is above 80 degrees, temp, too high and I'll make that red and I'll just tie a link here we had already created our high temp alarm so I'll press OK I'm gonna make that nice and big so we can see the whole thing and we are done with our application. So let's go ahead and download this and we're gonna see how this works. So I'm gonna go to download. Again, we have four download options. The download is just gonna put this logic in the controller, no reset or anything. So if you are already in the middle of writing a project, you just wanna make a quick download, that is the best download option to use, gonna be the quickest. Stop download reset is going to do just that. Stop the PLC, download, and then reset the controller for you. Download all and burn, burns a copy of the project to flash, and then burn upload project, burns it, and also provides you upload capability. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do a stop download reset. Actually, before that, let me just show you how I'm connecting to the unit. In my connection dropdown menu, I have the ability to check my current connection. If I'm connecting serially, Right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my device manager on the last tab. I'm gonna go to ports and I'm gonna see that my prolific USB to serial COM port is on COM4. So I'm gonna come back to my first tab, make sure COM4 is selected. Enhanced vision series, you are gonna need to use or you can use the max baud rate. Typically you would want to, that's gonna be your fastest means of downloading. If I click get OPLC information, if I have information returned, that means I have connection. What I'm doing here is I'm downloading over Ethernet to a V570, so I can change that connection type to serial, from serial to TCP IP call. What I need in this case is the IP address of the unit, and I don't want this to seem too much like magic, but we're gonna go into this in depth on the last session when we talk about communications. So just trust me that the IP address of my unit is 102290 and that the PLC name is 1471820 currently. So when I hit OK and click get OPLC information, you'll see I'm connected to my 570 and you'll also see how fast that connected as well. Ethernet is a much faster means of communication than serial. So I'll hit exit. I'm gonna go ahead and do a stop download reset. One message that I wanna point out is during the download process, right? You're gonna see that at the bottom of the download, one, I can abort, right? If I wanted to cancel, let's just say, it. Uh, if I prematurely click download, I can always abort out of it. Uh, I also have a message that says, this type of download cannot be uploaded in red bold. 
that is very important to keep track of. If you know that you need to have an uploadable copy in the future, you always, always, always want to make sure that you use the burn upload project option. That's going to guarantee you can at least, whether the password's set or not, have the shot to be able to pull it out. If you do not use that option, uh, we unfortunately don't have any backdoor password in order to help you get that, that project out. So you'll see that the download was successful. Visilogic will now send run command to the OPLC. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And this is now going to allow me to use online test mode. So you'll see a blue pair of glasses up here. I can also press F9 on my keyboard. This is going to be online test, right? And when online test is the most useful is in troubleshooting a project and also making sure a project works properly. So MB0, we're gonna go back up to the very first net that we created. You'll see that MB0 right now, even though the power rail is red, it is not passing power to our incrementer. And that is because it is normally open. Once I close it, if I set it, you'll see that at that point, now power is being passed. If I reset it, it stops. Now, this can help demonstrate why the positive transition conditions are important you'll see that on a particular button press right let's just say even if i just click this and click it off real quick we literally had almost a thousand instances of that incrementer going up by one right so at scan time that is passing power so if it's very vital to have a one-shot condition be sure that you're using one of the p or n contacts now, if we drop down to MB1, you'll see that because it is normally closed, it's passing power when it's off. If I turn it on, right, we can also see this in the operands list. If I turn MB1 high, you'll see this is now a value of 1. This value has stopped. Once I turn it back off again, it is now passing power. So that's the difference between normal and inverted. Now, positive transition, I'm just going to wipe these clear of a value. You'll see that online test mode is very dynamic. I have the ability to manipulate bits and also numbers. If I set this to one, right, you'll see that this bit is still high, but it's only passed power one time. I then turn it off. If I turn it on again, the rising edge passes power through to the incrementer. So that's what a positive transition is doing. Negative transition. If that bit is on and then falls, it passes power. So you'll see MB3 in my list here, it's off. If it goes high, my incrementer has not gone up yet. Once it falls low again, that is when it increments. So those are the difference between your one shots. Now, the rest of the, lo the, rest of the logic we created, we actually have HMI, um, created as well so if i wanted to go and see the screen currently i have the ability to use the fourth icon in on the online test toolbar and this is going to allow me to view exactly what's on the hmi so let's just say if i'm remote connected and i don't have the hmi right next to me i have the ability to see the hmi with built-in remote access and online test mode so online test mode is a very very neat feature now, if I press my first light switch, I'm going to come down here on my ladder net, right? My first button is ladder net five. If I press and hold my light, right, on screen, you'll see that we change the properties for color based on not touched and touched. I'm pressing and holding my light on screen. I'm pressing and holding my button and my light is on, right? Once I release from the button, MB4 is going to go low, which is going to turn MB5 low. Contrary to that, if I use my on and off button, right, if I press my on button, my light is on and stays on. You'll see MB8 is now in red. In order for me to turn off, I have to reset MB8, and the way that I've set that up is in Net7 with MB7 as my off button. If I press and hold this, right, because it's a negative transition, it's only going to pass power once I release. Now, if I press my button here, that is in net eight, this is going to allow me to jump to screen two. I now have my toggle light switch with my toggle light, right? And since it's a positive transition, the instance I touch it, even if I'm holding, that light only changes one state. 
if I had a direct contact there, that toggle light would get triggered at scan time, right? So I have no way of knowing with the naked eye what state is going to be the state once I release. So that's why positive transitions are, are and negative transitions are very important. Now, if I press it again, it reverts back to the previous state from what it was. Next, I have my delay switch. And you'll see on screen, I've powered up with a preset value of five seconds. If I press my delay button, you'll see my time go down. That is me powering my timer. Once my timer reaches zero, my output bit goes on, which passes power to my light, right? Now my button is powering the timer. My timer is powering my light. Once I release power from the button, my timer is no longer powered, so my light is no longer powered. Now, if you don't want to have a user just sit there and press the button to run like a full uh, sequence or, or uh, um, portion of the application, you can use soft bits. So I could set a bit and have that bit run the timer. So I, all I have to do is just press the button one time, like let's just say a start button or a reset button or something like that. So you don't, you, you basically can use the timers how, however you need. And when it comes to timers, you have three different types. You have a delay timer that counts down from its preset. If you release power at any point, you have to start from the preset again when you uh, press what, or, or whenever the event that is powering the timer, whenever you trigger that again, it's going to start from the preset. You also have timer accumulated, which unlike the delay timer that does not retain the current, the timer accumulated is going to retain the current. So let's just say if I have a preset value of 10 seconds, if I press my button or my trigger for two seconds and it gets to eight, the next time I press it, it's going to start from eight and not from 10. So timer accumulated uh, can be very helpful in like total runtime hours and situations like that. You also have a timer extended pulse where when the timer is running, the bit is on and once the timer runs out, the bit goes off. And last but not least, I have my uh, temperature entry, right? So on screen, if I have my user enter a value of, let's just say, we'll say 50, you'll see that my temp is still okay. And that's because I'm comparing against a constant value of 80 and I'm using a greater than block, right? So even if I'm at 80, my temp is still okay. But once I go to 81, you'll see that now my temp is too high. So you have a nice number of um, elements in the ladder and the HMI in order to accomplish whatever uh, you need in an application. Now, I just wanna point out one thing before I take questions. Uh, again, I, I know that I went over a little an hour, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but you also have in the hardware configuration for the project, a number of analog inputs. So you saw that once we added a hardware configuration, it gives you your number of digital inputs and outputs based on these two tabs. You'll see that I have 14 digital outputs here. Um, that means that I'm gonna have 14 digital outputs in use in my project. Analog inputs and analog outputs are not in use until you tie a memory uh, or, or an operand to it. So if I, let's just say, if I had a zero to 10 volt signal coming in, you'll see that it asked me to link an operand that is not currently in use for this analog input. So I can get next unused, and this can be my zero to 10 volt signal for IO module. So that is how the memory ties the ladder, the HMI, and the IO together. Uh, I really thank you guys for attending today. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to take questions now. Okay. Okay, um, can we download and burn multiple times through project development? Yes, so you absolutely have the ability to do that. What I will say is when you do any download, right, 
the next download overwrites what had happened previously. So let's just say if I do a burn uh, upload, right, and I've given the user to be able to go back, uh, the ability to go back and upload the project, let's just say in testing, if I do a stop download reset, it basically clears out those DLUs that would allow me to upload and now I don't have the ability to do so. So what I typically recommend, just because it's probably the it's the fastest means of, of downloading if in, in troubleshooting or testing or development, if you do a download or a stop download reset, um, that's gonna be your fastest way to load the project. When you want to ship out or install, that is when you wanna do a download uh, and burn. But if you make project changes, let's just say if you did a download all and burn and then you add a portion of the project, you want to make sure that you do another download all and burn. There's no limit to how many times you can burn to the controller. And the reason for that is because the next download option overwrites what you have done previously. Can we do online editing in our ladder program? Unfortunately, you cannot. Um, in Visilogic, it's almost going to seem like you can. Um, in online test mode, you have the ability, even in a blank project, like if I just opened up a blank project here, I would still have the ability to manipulate the memory that is part of the controller that I'm downloaded to, but that is very dangerous because you can't see exactly what you're doing. So let's just say if that temp setting, right, uh, if I had a blank project, if I just accidentally clicked on MI4 and set it to like 85, that might turn the temp too high and, and do damage to, to the system. You know what I mean? So you want to make sure that you're creating a project, downloading, and then testing. Can we run the program in offline mode? Yeah, so you have the ability, I mean, once the, once the controller is, uh, once the controller houses the program, you can do everything right from the face of the HMI. But if you want that additional interface of the logic in order to kind of see power flow and stuff like that because you can't unfortunately see power flow um, in a nice neat format if you will like online test mode I mean you can do everything right from the face, face of the panel once the once the controller has has been downloaded to can you explain how the physical inputs can be used in the program absolutely I'm gonna hit okay here and in my next net net 13 if I come down here, let's just say if I have uh, like some sort of photo eye or, or a sensor or something that's like counting like the number of cans, what I can do is I can grab an input here and you'll see that based on the IO configuration, I have zero through 15 in use. I can grab whatever one I want that's tied physically to that channel, hit OK. And this, let's just say if I wanted to count the number of parts going by, I can have an incremental here. I also have an online mode, the ability to force that input. So if I don't have anything tied to it, um, I can still force it and see what it would do if I did have something physically tied to it, which is which is a nice feature. And also one thing I forgot to mention, I'm going to save this project uh, and I can send it to anybody who wants it. So just drop me a line after after today's webinar. If you want this project, it will it will absolutely be uh, available for you. Okay, um, could you please explain online point in debug? Yeah, so um, again, when you are, when you're trying to troubleshoot an issue, uh, there are a lot of different tools that you have at your leisure, which is nice, right? You have the ability to um, do everything from add incrementers to the end of nets to make sure everything is is being triggered properly you also have the ability to use online mode and remote access so when you go into online mode um, that's basically going to bring up your online toolbar where you have the ability to run one cycle of the project pull up the hmi uh, and so on if you do not use online mode um again you you once you have the project downloaded you know you have the ability to to run it offline no problem but online mode is basically your ability to uh troubleshoot in a in a in a sense okay next one here um 
can we simulate with the software? Unfortunately, you cannot. Uh, you do not have the ability to um, simulate with any of our software packages. You would need a a physical piece of hardware in order to to download to, uh, and then you have online test mode available. Okay, different. Uh, the difference between inputs and high-speed inputs, right? Um, if you have some sort of sensor, like let's just say again, we'll use the we'll use the can counting uh, example again. If you have an input um, that you basically just want to keep track, let's just say if you have a belt that's moving pretty slow, uh, it's all going to be based on the the frequency that you need, right? So. If you have a belt that's moving really, really slow, you can use just a normal digital input that will just catch that can coming by. If you have a belt that is moving extremely fast, let's just say if you need to count like, I don't know, a thousand pieces within a certain amount of time, that is a time when a high speed input would be much more useful. It will guarantee you that you don't miss uh, any counts. But again, it, it really all depends on, on the application at hand. Okay, so web server, right? I have one that is to explain uh, web server. The web server feature, again, uh, it's more along the lines for the conversation and communications, but your web server options are advanced and simple. Simple, you have a predefined out, out, uh, outlook or template, if you will, right? And you just choose whatever memory you want accessible uh, on the web page. If you go the advanced route, um, the advanced route is going to allow you to basically build an HMI page with, with HTML. So you can have custom videos, custom files, and so on. You have a lot more capability. Uh, the only thing you need is an SD card inserted in the unit and all of those custom images in the web folder. Okay, what are the IO extension options for Samba? So uh, that's a great question, right? Samba by default is not going to be expandable, and I'm air quoting, right? You don't have the EXP port like you do with the Vision series. Um, you do have a means to, right? So you have the first means is over CAN bus with the EXRC1. Now, that is... Um, a little bit tedious, right? Because the EXRC1 is going to need its own application and you're actually going to have to install a CAN bus port on the Samba, which does not come default. So if uh, that situation arises, if you're not already like too deep into the woods with the Samba, it's usually best to bump up to a vision. It's going to be a lot more uh, of a situation where it's like plug and play as opposed to programming a bunch of stuff. Um, but now with the new remote IO, you do have the ability to add the URB TCP to a project uh, and you can expand that way. So that, that would be your best expansion option, if you will. Uh, okay, great question. What is the difference between modules and displays? Okay, so um, modules you can think of as like a folder, if you will, right? Or a group of displays. The displays are gonna be your actual physical HMIs or displays that you can get to within the application. Now, if you had a huge project and you just wanted to keep everything tidy, right? You can have a module for your maintenance screens. You can have a module for your screens where you can change communication settings. Um, you can have like, if you have like a couple of different screen savers, you can have a module for your screen savers and so on. They do not affect scan time. And that's the same deal with the logic, right? Um, if you have a number of different modules, you only have one main routine still, and you still have to call all of your subroutines based on what you're trying to do. When X, when are X operands used ideally? Uh, another good question. Um, I I tend to find in a project, let's just a, a lot of cases, right? You are either going to have 
a situation where you need the memory retained or you want a power up value, right? If you do not need the memory to be retained, you can use a fast operand. If you have a power up value of reset, the fast operand is going to be able to take place of that memory operand with a power up value of reset because it, it literally just doesn't hold its state on, on power cycle. So a lot of times I, I very rarely use X operands unless I have reached or getting close to the ceiling of memory. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to allow you to uh, replace any memory operands that you could use to um, have a power of value of set or retain, right? You can basically replace uh, a fast operand with uh, a memory operand where, where, where you don't need to, to retain that value. So again, fast operands are, are there for you if you need them. In a lot of situations, you're going to have enough memory operands to complete a project unless it's like a huge project with a lot, with a lot going on. Um, okay, yeah, uh, so I have a couple of questions. Will this be posted for the future? Uh, we actually have a link um, available that, that we can send to you that's going to give you all of the previously recorded webinars and also the schedule for upcoming that you can just revisit, and that is going to allow you to see all of the recordings eventually. Um, a little bit more specific, right? I actually created a project for this webinar, and then the next two webinars, I'm going to have some sort of project. If you guys want to see that specifically, if you just shoot me an email, I'd be happy to to, to link you the project. Uh, One second here. Okay. Um, I have a lot of sound test comments, so I, I appreciate that. Is the software available for free or do I have to buy it? You will not have to buy the software, nor do you need any sort of re-up on licensing. The software is available on our website. Um, all you have to do is just go to unitronicsplc.com. There's a software drop down based on if you need Unilogic, Visilogic, uh, or U90. You just click on that option, and then you're going to have an option for the most recently released software package, and then also um, the previously released versions, right? And if you if you ever need any versions that are not listed there, just shoot us a, an email, and we'd be happy to provide it for you. Um, is the upload is the upload ability to get the project from the PLC? Is there any information that is lost? No. So when you upload, right, um, you have the ability to comment a project as well. So when you download the project and you provide upload capability with that burn upload option, um, it's actually going to pull the logic and the comments for you. So um, you don't lose anything that that I can think of. The one thing that I I have seen pop up right is if you pull an old project, um, if you're trying to download to a different module with like a different I/O configuration, that is going to definitely introduce some some issues for you. Is a screensaver available? Yes, it is. Right. So, um, like I mentioned on screen one that I have here in the in the demonstration, you'll see that the bolded screen is your startup display. So you want to have any sort of splash screen on uh, that particular display. On power up, what you can do, you can use SB2 to set a bit that runs a timer just like we did with our button for let's just say 30 seconds or something like that. And then the trigger when the timer runs out is to jump to whatever screen you want that again air quoting main screen to be so you would have the splash screen as the startup display and then display one would be the first actual usable display in the project
if you are using remote access can you operate the screen with your mouse absolutely um i had the i thankfully i have my unit right next to me so i was just doing it right on the hmi display but you have the ability to press buttons uh and change values in numeric registers with your your mouse absolutely if the battery is drained out will it delete the program and register values battery issues are going to introduce memory issues um, it's not necessarily going to kick your project. What will kick a project is violent shock, violent vibration, extended power outage, um, things to that nature, right? When the battery, when the battery low bit goes high, um, you have roughly two weeks to change that battery out, and it's just the normal three volt coin cell batteries uh, before you start to experience memory issues so you don't have to like if that battery bit goes high and you and let's just say in a case where you literally are sitting there and you see it go high it's not like you're immediately going to start losing vital information uh, but you definitely want to change it as soon as possible for sure Okay, so um, there's a question about creating two screens and using the same buttons. You have the ability, you can, like literally what you can do is you can just copy and paste. Like let's just say if you know you're gonna have like a home button, a next button, a previous button, a button to get to like maintenance screens and stuff like that. If you have a predefined template, you can use that template, just copy and paste it as many times as you need. You just wanna make sure the links and jumps tab on each page um, are, kosher right so you want to make sure that if you press that button and you're on a certain page you get to where you need to go so you definitely have the ability to just create like cookie cutter screens uh, how can i find a local distributor um, if you email uh the sales team um, usa.sales at unitronics.com we can absolutely point you in the direction uh if you shoot us an email we can we can guide you to, to the sales team. If you want to give us a call, we can we can transfer you over to sales. Either way, you just want to, uh, in, in tech support, we really deal with um, technical uh, issues and inquiries. Anything that is related to buying, uh, pricing, and availability usually would go to sales. Okay, how do the math function works? How, the, how do the math functions work? Uh, based on the operand type you're using, right you're gonna have different uh, options available for adding subtracting creating a formula one of the things that i again like in a normal training i would have plenty of time to to go into this and explain this it's tough to to cram everything efficiently and effectively into one hour but uh normally like if you wanted to use a formula let's just say you're trying to like uh always calculate like a flow rate or something like that or like a temperature conversion you have the ability to create your own formula with different operands right so if you wanted to have like a number of different operands be your inputs to the formula and you and your result be a real number you can actually link a float uh at the at, at, at the end as as the result uh great question how do you add comments if you right click in a net you have the ability to choose insert comment click back into the net that you want to add the comment for and it's going to open up this box and i can type in use input to increase counter by one. Okay, so question about uh, the hardware changing, right? So um, it, it it's a little bit of, it's a tricky one to answer unless I know like the the specific situation, right? Um, and a lot of times you have the ability to just change out the the hardware model, and let's just say if you have more or less uh, I/O that that is available, right? It will just siphon everything that was in the previous project and file it into the new project. Um, what you want to be weary of is if you create a project and change the hardware configuration since you are 
using MIs for analog inputs and analog outputs, you do not want to overwrite any values, right? You want to make sure that you are using MIs that are not previously in use. That's that's very important to, to keep track of. Okay, uh, incremental encoders, what are, so you have, uh, for high speed inputs, right, you, you can have a high speed encoder or high speed counter. You also have the ability for shaft encoder and you can use A, B signal and the positive and negative of A and B as well. And that all depends on the model that you're using. So when you do a, um, when you're specking out the project itself, right, you want to make sure that you have a model selected that is going to give you the number one number of inputs that you need and two the speed that you would need. Uh, analog input filter options you have the ability for a filter function block you also have uh, filter options for none uh, low, medium, and strong that are going to average readings based or, or a number of, of readings based on the filter of your choosing to smooth out your, your input. So that's done in the hardware configuration or you can use the function block in the logic. How do I store a number with a point in a data table, right? So you have the, this is, you have a number of options uh, once decimals come into play, right? You have the ability in your numeric element, right? If you wanted to use whole numbers, if you wanted to use MIs throughout the project, you have the ability to force them to look like they have decimals by, by using scaling. And then in the actual HMI itself, like when you go to drop the operand down, uh, when you drop the operand and, and 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 this menu pops up, right? Like, let's just say if I wanted to show something as uh, the true value within the register is a thousand, I wanted to show it as a hundred point zero, right? I have the ability to manipulate it so it looks like I want it to on screen. Um, you also can use floats, and then you also have the ability to convert the number to a string, and you can store the string uh, as well. Uh, great, so in-depth question, in depth question, great question though. Hi, from motion control, uh, what is the advantage of Unilogic or Visilogic? It really is based on what you're doing, how you would like to achieve it, and how many instances of motion control uh, you need. In a lot of cases, um, the, the Unilogic and Unistream package is going to be more versatile and capable. Uh, the vision series is nice because you actually have built-in PTO functionality for stepper motors, right? So um, if you have a situation where you you know you need to to, to control a stepper motor driver with with PTO, um, I wouldn't even think in the direction of Unistream. I, I I think that the vision series would be able to do that just fine. Um, you also have a number of different communication options. So based on the communication protocol that you might be communicating to a servo with. Uh, you have different protocols and also the same protocols available across the controller series. So it all depends on uh, what else is incorporated in the project uh, along with um, how you want to control the, the stepper motor, just, just, in, just in, a, in a simple example again. So like you have uh, built-in PTO with the smaller enhanced vision series units, uh, for example, can open to like a servo, you have can open in Unilogic and Invisilogic. So if you need a 15 inch screen, that would put you into the Unistream series. If you also need to do Ethernet IP at some point, that pushes you into the Unistream series. So there's a lot of different moving parts uh, based on what's needed for the application, but, but great question. Uh, Running, okay, so running software on something that is not Windows. We have system specs that we uh, recommend slash push you to 
abide by. Um, I have seen people use virtual machines with no issues. I have seen people use virtual machines with constant issues. Uh, so as long as you are abiding by the system requirements, typically there's gonna, even if you run into runtime issues, we usually can work you through it. Um, there's not really much we can do in a, in a situation where uh, you're trying to run the software on, on something else, unfortunately. C functions in Visilogic, no, only in Unilogic. Yes, so uh, can you scale analog inputs and outputs? Absolutely, and actually you're, you're in, in a lot of cases, especially on the analog input side, you're more often than not going to have to just to see the true engineering values. And what I mean by that is based on the resolution of the analog input, you do two to the power of whatever that resolution value is, 10, 12, or 14, that is the number of units that is the scale for that value to come in on. If it's a zero to 10 volt signal, it's not going to come in zero, one, two, or 10 volts, right? it's going to come in on that scale. So what you want to do is you want to set up a linearization block in the math drop down menu. And what that's going to allow you to do, it's located right here. What that's going to allow you to do is set up your scales, right? So you're going to have your input side, which is the actual analog input coming in. You're going to have zero to whatever the high end of that resolution would be. Let's just say, um if it's 14 bit right you have 16 0 to 16 383 and then y1 to y2 is going to be your output value that's going to be your true engineering value so that's going to be your 0 to 10 volt signal 0 to 20 million of signal now especially in a case where you have 12 bit or 14 bit resolution use as much as that scale as possible right so like instead of just uh linearizing from 0 to 10 linearize from zero to a thousand and on screen make it look like zero to ten point zero zero that's going to give you uh the most bang for your buck if you will right so the x is the input the physical input and the y is going to be what you want it to come out as or view as can we use multiple hmis yes uh so there's a little bit of work involved right it's not like um it's not like you can just set up like two screens in like a menu on the hmi display and have them communicate you actually have to have some sort of communication in between the two so if you wanted to let's just say use two 570s or a 350 and a 570 there has to be some communication protocol going back and forth that is allowing you to update the panel that is not the one that is currently active if that makes sense Um, can you, I think that that was a portion of another question. Hold on one second. Okay. So great, great question. Before you download a program, is it, is it mandatory to build all and compile it first? Um, so I'm going to skip build all for a second the compiler is always going to run when you download so you can you can use this compile icon here and that will run the compiler for you if you're just let's just say you program a net you're not sure if it's going to work you're not sure if it's legal you can compile it without downloading it will tell you if there's anything wrong or if there's any excuse me or any warnings in the project um when you download the compile runs automatically so it will tell you if there's something that's going to prevent like the the download itself um build all right if you have particular issues in the project uh let's just say if you have like issues with like images or system images in the project that's really the time where you want to um go out of your way to use the build all i very rarely have to use build all it's mostly just coming down to compilation errors that need to get that need to get fixed um i am not gonna so are you gonna go over alarms i am not going to go over alarms just because these are really meant to be uh broad more so than dive into specific um topics right uh 
I, if you want to shoot in an email, we can provide you some um, examples of alarms and you can also take a look in the, in the help file, but we don't have like a specific day that we're going to go over uh, alarms just yet at least. Uh, are you able to force on and off physical inputs through the software? Yes, you can. In online mode, um, you have the ability to right-click on the input that you're using, and you're going to have an option to force on, force off, and then also cancel the force. So just be sure that uh, if you are forcing in online mode, you want to make sure that you cancel uh, at some point. The way that you can determine if you are currently in force mode, is you're gonna have triangle brackets around that particular input. So if you see that at any point, you just wanna make sure that you right click and, and cancel the force. Okay, um, it looks like that was the last question. I just wanna make sure that I didn't, Okay, different, okay, difference in uh, different outputs, right? You have relay outputs and transistor outputs. Uh, the difference, right? Relay outputs are gonna be a mechanical piece, like it's a, it's a physical relay, like literally, like and and when you trigger it, you can hear an uh, an audible click. Um, the downfall to relay outputs is they do have a lifespan, right? So if you have either a high speed application or you know that that output is gonna be doing some work in a project, uh, transistor outputs are a, be a better route to, to, to take. What are system bits? System bits, again, are just uh, internal bits to the project that you can either use or not use. They are literally part of every single project that gets created. Um, and again, they're gonna be different things like the power up bit, uh, the battery low bit. If a if a system bit, I, I'm sorry. If a if a if the screen is touched, there's a system bit for it. Uh, you also have system integers as well that you can use. So I mentioned system bit 16 is if the touch screen is touched. You have SI 40 and 41 for the the location of the touch on X Y coordinates, um, and that can those can be very very helpful when you're troubleshooting potential HMI damage. Um, if you know that you're having some weird issues with the touch screen, go in online uh, and just poke around the screen, right? Make sure system bit 16 turns high on every touch. If it doesn't, then you might have some problems. Based on where you are touching, keep track, like you can literally just touch the screen and just drag your finger while touching around the screen and you should see SI40 and 41 update accordingly. If you see one of those coordinates locked, um, that's going to be a situation where you want to call us and, and we'll we'll be able to do some some troubleshooting with you. Okay, and again, guys, so uh, that looks like that is uh, all of the questions that I can see. Um, again, we we're going to have all these available for you. Um, so just if you, if you have trouble finding it, drop us a line. We'll be able to get you a link for the webinars from last week, this week, and then the schedule for upcoming. And you can always revisit that link in order to see um, what has been added, right? And then also for this particular project, if, if anybody wants this particular project, uh, we'll probably get it on the website at, at some point. But right now, I mean, I... I I'm gonna save it to, to my desktop, so if you need it, just drop me a line and I can I can shoot it over to you. Uh, but I appreciate you guys attending. Make sure that you tune in next Tuesday uh, for Zach's Unilogic presentation on data logging. I know that I'm looking forward to it, uh, so I hope you guys are too. And I appreciate you attending today. Thank you guys, stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to talking to you next week.